I'm Dave Ingebretson, and along with Leroy Hyatt, we'd like to welcome you again to another edition of Fly Tying, the Angler's Art. You know, Leroy, if you get two fly fishers, one from, say, Pennsylvania and one from Montana, they could be sitting in a restaurant, have a great conversation about fishing some fabulous green drake hatches. And the green drake hatches <laughs> are very uh, impressive wherever you find them and, and uh, bring some good fish to the surface. The problem is, once they go to change patterns with each other, They'll say, hey, wait a minute, that's not the green drake. And the guy from Pennsylvania, well, that's not the green drake. Because they don't realize that they're talking about two completely different bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, in the east, we're talking about, to get technical for a minute, they're talking about ephemera guccellata. And in the west, it's Drunella grandis. Uh, they're different size, different colors, totally different. And so, of course, the patterns are different. So what we'd like to do today is tie both the eastern and the western green drake duns for you along with the, the Eastern Green Drake Spinner, which is uh, another cat altogether. So why don't we start with the Eastern Green Drake, the Ephemera Guccellata imitation. And I should say, Leroy, I've got one book at home that lists 56 different Green Drake patterns for the Eastern <laughs> Green Drake, none of which are like we're going to tie today. So there's a whole lot of different patterns out there, and this oh, is I'm not sure the beef is. fly. This is one of them. This is just one of the patterns. We'll use two different colored hackles this time. We'll use a dark brown, a mahogany brown saddle. We'll use a light cream or white color for the hackle material. For the tail, we'll use dark moose body hair. For the wing, this time we have just a mallard flight feather that's dyed kind of a, of a greenish yellow. The dubbing, again, we've mixed it up right here. It's just a cream dubbing, and the thread will be a 6 aught. Uh, cream thread. I put a standard dry fly hook in the vise. The barb has been pinched. Now these are big flies, big so you're flies. using a number eight hook. This is a number eight. I'm going to dress just the front of this hackle, or this hook, just to get the wing in. You know, along with the uh, giant hexagenia mayflies, which could have be as much as two inches long, uh, these eastern green drakes are among the largest of the dry flies. Oh, really? Didn't so, of course, that. they can bring up some very large fish. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, the green drake hatch comes on. You can expect it in the east by Memorial Day, anytime from about June 25th on, and it's an evening hatch. Oh, it is uh, evening. It usually comes on just at dark, and I've been on, uh, oh, the Pope Hattie stretch, for example, of uh, Penn's Creek in Pennsylvania, and when these things come off, it's a huge hatch, and the flies are so big, you can actually actually hear them hitting your rod as you cast. Oh, really? Click, 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 and the sky it will just be huh. just loaded with these. It's an amazing thing to see. Uh, what I've done is I've just tied that mallard flank on. I'm just going to take a quick figure eight with it, just to make sure they're divided. And I'll go to the rear of the hook. Now we'll use a little bit of the moose body. I like this moose body on a fly like this because it's stiff, it's a little bit heavier, and it will sure help keep that fly floating. And that's what you also, need on a fly like this, is you need a heavy hackle and, and good stiff tail uh, to keep that thing up. want this about the length of the uh, shank of the hook, and I'm going to make it so that it, it will come up and touch the... Uh, butts of the wing we just put in to get that that's, smooth body. That's always a good a good practice so you get that smooth It probably it. isn't all that necessary on this one because we're dubbing it, but yeah. still. We'll that put still a little yeah. rubber base cement on the butt sections of that Now we tail. might remind viewers that uh, missed some of our earlier shows uh, that this rubber base cement we're talking about is basically this rubber uh, tennis shoe repair that material they, right. because of a variety of brands, number mm -hmm. of brands. But you thin that down with toluene, toluene. or a toluene based thinner. Lacquer thinner. And uh, it does Broke a very good thread. job of, of uh, strengthening the fly. Now, I remember I broke the thread once, I think it was back in, oh gosh, the late 60s sometime. You can't remember that uh, far back. I can't huh? remember exactly, but it does happen. Uh, and uh, that's another good thing, you had that cement on there. Uh, held unwound. things in place and you didn't lose your tail, you sure. could just keep right on going. So it's another good reason for doing it. But don't fret if your thread breaks, it happens oh, to all of us. Absolutely. And, uh, you just there, go on. now there you can go. start it all over. Okay, now this body again, we're going to put the dubbing on 
fairly light. Uh, you can build it up as you go. We do want to taper to it. I might say one thing about the body color. If you look at the natural insect of this eastern green drake, the back is dark olive and the belly is the light creamy color. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of people wonder, well, they look at the fly and it looks so green. Why do you tie the body with this light cream color? Well, of course, the reason is that the fish sees this thing from underneath and it's the, the belly color that the, the uh, fish sees. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep that in mind all the time when you're uh, tying flies that it's the belly color that the fish sees, not the back color that you see, and that's what you're trying to imitate. Okay. Now we'll just keep moving this up. Need just a little bit more dubbing here. And then this fly does call for two different hackles. Calls for a light hackle in the rear. Lay it right behind the wing and tie it in, and I want to move my thread forward. I would actually, on a fly this big, you might want to use two hackles in the rear. If you're using neck. Uh, uh, just to get it heavily hackled. If this happens using neck, to be yeah. a saddle, and I think it will work all right. Yeah, with those long saddles, that'll be fine. But if I'm you looking. are using neck hackle, I would use two in the back to get it heavily hackled and then put the dark one in front. And I've got to say that this particular pattern uh, with the dark hackle in front, I haven't, I haven't used myself. Oh, I really? I haven't seen it uh, done that way. Well, to me, it would seem to be easier if, if you would put the white hackle in front. It would be so much easier for the fishermen to see it. Well, I guess they're trying to represent Imitate whatever the bug looks like. something, yes. Yeah. But we'll do it as yeah. the pattern says and mm -hmm. run this dark one forward. Tie it off, put a quick whip finish on it. Oh, I've spent some terrific nights out in the pitch black fishing this thing when you could hardly oh, is see that it. Right? Uh, but of course the fish up against the, you know, they're looking up towards the sky, they can see it. Mm -hmm. And of course you start fishing it before it's totally dark too. But And there's the eastern green drake. Why don't we skip the head cement on that? We, of course, we'll put head cement on it, but mm -hmm. we're running a little long, so let's, uh, let's just moose, show the fly. Moose tail for the tail, the tan dubbing, the mallard uh, flank for the mm -hmm. hackle, or I mean for the wing, and the white and the brown hackle material. Yeah. Now we've seen the eastern green drake done, uh, you also have just about have to have the green drake spinner uh, to go along with it when you're fishing the hatch. This spinner is called oftentimes the coffin fly. And I guess it's probably because of the dead waxy white color of this thing. When you see the natural insect, the body is, it really looks waxy. Oh, does it? Uh, waxy white. And it's basically a very light colored fly. Okay, for the material for this fly, we'll use a light tan deer hair. This will become the tail. They will be split to help that fly set in the water because there is no hackle. The wings will be the gray poly, will be spent wing or tied directly out away from the side of the fly. The body is pure white dubbing and the thread is a standard six-aught uh, white thread. I have it again a size eight hook in the vise. I have mashed the barb on it. And we'll run this tying thread to the rear. You know, the eastern fishermen really look forward to this hatch because it is such a huge fly, it brings up big fish. Mm. And uh, out there, they're used to fishing small flies. Uh, you know, 16s, 18s, even smaller. Some, you know, the 14s too. But uh, this is a, a good fly to tie. It's a good fly to see. And of course, the hatch comes on in the evening. Uh, it comes on very close to dark and well on into dark. The hatches are huge hatches. Uh, but I, you could see them after dark. Uh, well, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> there's so many of them that your natural oftentimes doesn't have much, much of a chance either. The fishing is sometimes better when the hatch is building because I've been in at the Poe Patty section of Penn's Creek when the hatch has been so heavy uh, that you'd hear the flies hitting your rod as you cast. It'd oh, click, really? Click, 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 click. Just thousands of these things. Huh. And, of course, the fishing, even though there's fish working everywhere, the f fishing is very difficult because uh, with a thousand naturals out there not being so eaten either, 
your poor little artificial doesn't stand much chance. Doesn't look right, so does it? sometimes the fishing is better as the hatch is building. Well, what are you doing now with the tails? What I did is I put just a little ball of white dubbing in. Now I'm taking two different sections of this tan deer and putting it on either side of that ball. What that's doing is just giving me a split tail. Bind down those. They'll be covered anyway as we go forward with the dubbing. This one might have just a few too many. I'll go ahead and break a few of those off. You don't need too many. You know, four or five on each side need, yeah. is, is all you need. But. Then we'll do, this fly will not have as much taper in it, the body section, as the uh, dry fly did. Now, the, uh, the spinners are fairly slim and uh, not nearly as much taper as you say. You know, the transformation between the dun and the spinner is remarkable. Uh, because of the greenish coloration in the back and the wings and so on of the dun, the model colored wings. Uh, here you get to the spinner and the wings are glassy clear and this deathly white pale uh, body uh, and, and the, the wings. Uh, many people don't even realize that this, these are two different forms of the state, same bug. Oh, uh -huh. I've gotten in rather uh, vigorous discussions with other anglers along the stream who who have no idea that they're fishing two versions of the same fly. Same thing. fly. Yeah. Now I'll tie the spent wing. We'll just take a piece of, uh, of gray poly here, cut some of that loose. Just going to lay it on top. I don't care what the length is. I'll adjust that in a bit. And just figure eight it. That's all I'm going to do. And I'm going to cut some of that off. It's a little bit too long. I'll just stand it up and clip it just mainly to get it out of the way for now. Well, and that's a good way to make it even, too, is to stand them up and clip them together. Well, I want to just get them a little bit shorter so I can dub around them. We're going to figure eight with this du uh, dubbing. And that builds up a little thorax area, which is natural mm -hmm. uh, in the insect. Don't know if that'll be enough and or course, not, but we'll you know, see. This is a fairly easy fly to tie. There's it not is. A lot it's involved. quick. Yeah. And, uh, but I really encourage people, if you are going to fish the eastern green drake hatch, to make sure that you have both the dun and the spinner version of the fly. Now, I just figurated that white dubbing right between those wings. Now I'm to the front. I'm going to move it all aside. Just take a very little wrap here with the... Put a whip finish on it. Now, the wings are still far too long. Uh, I don't want them that long at all. Remember, I'll just bring it up. Remember, this is a fairly big fly, though, people, so you don't want to clip them too no, short. No, you don't want them written off. No. That may still be just a little bit long. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't cut them any shorter than yep, that. Yeah, that's about that's right, just, right uh, there. That's plenty short. But there's the coffin fly. Let's now what I'll do, put a black background, and then the we'll rotate it up there where you, you can see what it looks like. You can now, see the split tail. If we were going to critique that fly, I think one thing you probably want to try for is a, f a f uh, few less tail fibers mm -hmm. and maybe tie them in so they don't flare quite so much, uh, which is hard to do using this particular material. Dear her. But that is the coffin fly. We've used uh, natural tan deer hair for the tails, we've used a white dubbing, and gray poly for the wings. Now we're going to move west and tie the western version of the green drake. This will be the uh, fly that imitates the Drunella grandis. Uh, it still throws me, it used to be Ephemerella grandis, and then the, somebody changed the names on me, and I'm finally getting it down now, Drunella grandis, for what it's worth. Uh, you'll see that this is a totally different uh, fly in terms of coloration, and it's a little bit smaller now. Instead of tying it on an 8, we're going to tie it on a number 10. Size 10. Mm -hmm. Size 10 dry fly hook. What are you going to use? Okay, we'll use a dark dun hackle, a blue dun hackle for the wing, or for the hackle, I mean. For the tail, we'll use again the dark black moose body hair. The wing will depart a little bit. I'll use a, an upright gray poly wing. The ribbing will be a yellow floss, yellow thread could be used the same. The dubbing will be a very dark green dubbing, and the, the thread will be a 6 aught green thread. Really olive as much as anything. Yeah. Okay, yes. And again, we have to say this is just one of the many 
western green drake patterns. Lots there are and lots. lots and lots of variations, but basically they have this color scheme, of course, mm -hmm. which is a color scheme of the natural. And uh, if you've ever seen the bugs, you'll know that they have a very prominent uh, yellower, greenish, uh, light greenish rib. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that shows up. I'm going to tie in this wing. I just figure eight it a couple of times here. And again, I'm about a third of the way back. And then I'm going to stand it upright. And to give it some body, I'm going to wrap it around the thread, uh, make a little base around this wing, just to give it a little bit more support. And you know what I often do after I've done that and got them positioned in the upright position is I put a drop of head cement on mm -hmm. both of them. Mm -hmm. And it kind of firms them up uh, in position, especially when I'm using the poly. And this poly, uh, you know, it's maybe cheating the system a little to use it, but it is very, very water resistant. It will float very well. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have seen this fly tied where they will depart from the standard stuff and reuse some real bright fluorescent mm -hmm. wing material that you can just see forever. Now, of course, another normal way of doing it uh, is to use dyed gray calf tail. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of the patterns call for the calf tail wing rather than the poly. Mm -hmm. And well, actually, I, I like that. It's a little more of a wolf type yes. uh, tie. Uh, it's got that western look to it. And of course, uh, the calf tail probably has got some buoyancy there too. Now I'll go back and tie the tail. Those wings are still too long, but I'll adjust those when I get to it. That's the nice part about poly is you can trim that. You sure can. Now this I want to be about the length of the shank of the hook. So I'll lay it on there and measure it pretty close. Clip it off, soft loop it, and get it tied in. Here's another spot to use your uh, rubber-based yes. cement, I imagine. Yes, I went ahead and covered those up, but you could sure do that. Got one that ran down underneath. Now I'll tie in the ribbing material. This happens to be a four-strand floss. I'm going to use just a single strand of it. I think it will rib all right. One should be plenty, especially if you counter-wrap it to the direction yes. you wrapped on the dubbing right. to make it stand out. And now we'll put the dubbing on. Again, this will be a fairly... Uh, not a real heavy taper, a little bit of taper to it for the body material. And I will definitely reverse wrap that ribbing. Now, you know, we, we talked about the time of emergence in the east. Uh, the time of emergence of the green drakes in the west, all the western hatches vary considerably depending upon your elevation. Mm -hmm. Uh, water temperature. Yeah, the water temperature uh, too, but you know, you'll be, uh, hatches will come on much later, higher up because of the, the uh, temperatures and so on. Generally earlier at the lower elevations. Uh, I've seen this as late as well, well into July and as early as uh, late June. So uh, if you're in the West, you need to get you to know your own local waters and just when the hatches appear on them. And if you keep a little notebook and keep your own hatch charts uh, over a period of several years, you'll get to know when to expect these things mm -hmm. because in a normal year, they're going to be fairly much the same time. That's the key word, the normal year. Yeah, if there is such a thing. Okay, there's the body. Now I'm going to run this tying thread, I mean this single floss, reverse wrap, come through there, three oh, or four yeah, wraps. That will really out do and it looks nicely. Really good. Mm -hmm. I'll get rid of that. Then the hackle. That's exactly the appearance of the natural. That that light rib against the dark body, dark olive body. Mm -hmm. This one I'm going to put three flies or three hackles in. Uh, I like this fly to be a little bit heavier hackled. Well, and, and you have to adjust what you use to m your materials. If you were using a big, long genetic saddle, you'd use one. That could get by uh, here, in order to get one. the size, we discussed this before, uh, we started tying, frankly, 
And to get the size that we needed, we had to use the ends of the feathers we mm -hmm. had, and they simply weren't long enough with two, so we're putting three in. And that's just a matter of, of making adjustments to fit the with materials what you, you have. have. Yeah. I'll get a pair of hackle pliers on there. And we'll just make three or four wraps behind this wing section. Then I'll come forward. And again, wing. if your feathers are short, now where normally you might want to make a certain number of wraps behind with your next hacker, you may not be able to. No. You just uh, have to adjust have it length, next time. So again, through. you adjust. You bet. This one I'll be able to hang on to for a little while at least. Your two fingers are without a doubt the best hackle pliers you have. Oh, I've seen some fish, some great green drake hatches, uh, oh, on the railroad ranch of the Henry's Fork. I have seen and it on, on the, the Yellowstone River. Uh, the first trip I ever made to the Yellowstone area, I stopped into Bud Lilly's shop. He didn't know me from Adam, and uh, he was so helpful. He, uh, I was going to say he told me where to go, but a lot of people have done that. <laughs> uh, he suggested where I fish, uh, sent me to a specific location on the... Uh, Yellowstone River, and we got there in time. The green drakes were hatching, and we just had a field day fishing uh, large cutthroats. But the interesting thing is, I didn't have any real green drake patterns, but he suggested I use an olive bodied humpy, oh. uh, which worked just great. I'll bet it would. Yeah, worked just fine, but uh, probably would have done even better had we had this. Now I'll go ahead and put a whip finish on put here, and you can on there still and see that the wings are entirely too long. Yeah, we can trim those back. But those will be trimmed very, very easily. I'll just stand them up right here. Give a quick clip. And of course, normally, we've got to remind the beginning tires, you don't want to clip your Not materials. a hair wing. Not uh, a hair wing at all. But in a case like this, where the poly mm -hmm. wings are trimmed anyway, uh, you have the luxury of being able to trim them to the right length after you're done. Normally, uh, you want to select your materials to be the right length to begin with. There's a green drake. We'll get a little bit of a western green oh, drake, Oh, boy, that I looks good. Say. And look at that heavy hackle, which is going to float it. It will float the fly uh, very well. You've got it beautifully dense. It's, it's nicely uniform in size. The uh, ribbing is perfect. Uh, I guess if I were going to critique that fly, I, again, I kind of like the tail pulled together a little bit more rather than all that flare. Oh, than but, flared out. But again, uh, some materials it's harder to do that with yes. than others. Uh, you can adjust that by uh, not pulling quite so tightly on your, on the your the, the couple of turns there to mm -hmm. start with. Well, there's a western green drake. We've used a moose tail or moose body here for the tail, an olive dubbing ribbed with yellow floss, the dark dun hackle, and the gray poly wing. You know, today we've maybe kind of thrown some of you a curveball, especially if you're beginners, because we've used some Latin terminology. We've called some bugs by their Latin names. And as we've said before, the fish don't know the Latin names either. But uh, I suppose there are a couple of reasons for eventually learning Latin names. And you learn them by uh, doing as we did here, talk about the common names. And the big reason is that, as we said, two fishermen from different parts of the country can be using the same common names but be talking about completely different insects, different size, different shape, different uh, habitats. And uh, using Latin terminology, if you get to that point and want to do it, it's just a means of communication, Nolly Roy. That's the key word, if you want to do it. If you want to do it, because to I me, know. The Latin names mean absolutely yeah, I, I know nothing that these things, me. you got a glazed look in your face when yeah. I said them, and I, I knew that, you know, obviously you don't have to do it. But some people are of a scholarly nature like to get into that sort of thing just into for its the own reason. Thing. Absolutely. And uh, of course it gives you a framework to study the bugs, mm -hmm. learn about their life cycles and their various stages and appearances. So don't be thrown by the names, but if you want to do it, uh, start learning to call the, the uh, common names so look and see what the Latin terminology is to it. Well, I hope that's a little help for you and please don't be uncomfortable with those names. We we'll look forward to seeing you again next week and uh, tie some good flies in the meantime. Goodbye. Dave and Leroy have produced a new 90-minute video on fly tying techniques. To order a copy, call the number on your screen. These tips are only $28.95 plus $3.95 shipping and handling. Please have your credit card ready and call 1-800-883-0124 to order fly tying techniques. 
You can also order the programs in this series. There are three programs on each 90-minute tape for $22.95 plus shipping and handling. Call 1-800-883-0124 and order your fly tying videos or the Techniques tape.